started. Um, can everyone see the screen okay, the lovely harvest mouse? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Great. So uh, thank you for joining. It's really good to have you all here. I see a few familiar faces and a few people I probably haven't met yet. Uh, so it's great to have you uh, on board for the first, hopefully, in a series of talks about rewilding Ealing. Um, and we'll talk about rewilding as a word and, and why um, kind of we're talking about rewilding rather than nature conservation itself in a second. But um, the point of tonight's talk is really just to get people talking and get see who's interested in, um, in getting involved if we do go ahead with this project. Um, it's something that I've been looking into for quite a while uh, with this and other species. And it does rely on people getting involved and helping out. So I hope that some of you uh, will help in, in, in various ways. There's a few ways you can help. So harvest mice, um, first of all, to talk about them, what is a harvest mouse? Probably a good place to start when we're, at, when we're talking about a harvest mouse reintroduction project. Um, harvest mice are a, a very endearing little creature, very, uh, dare I say, cute little creature. Um, they're Britain and actually Europe's smallest rodent. They're not our smallest mammal. Um, there's a couple of species of bat and, and pygmy shrew that are um, smaller, but they're one of our smallest mammals and um, they are in decline, unfortunately. Um, but the smallest rodent in Britain and Europe is their accolade, their claim to fame. Um, as little as four to six grams, if you can hear a little bit of uh, rattling and scratching in the background, I'm looking after a friend's dog at the moment. She's having a little uh, little scratch. <laughs> um, she might join us. She's a bit vocal. She might join us if she gets bored of me rambling to you guys about harvest mice in a, in a, in a little while. Um, but yeah, they're tiny, tiny little mouse. And um, uniquely, they have, uh, amongst mice, they have kind of rounded hairy ears. Most mice that we have in the UK have um, quite bald ears and quite prominent ears. They've got a blunt nose similar to a vole kind of shape and very small eyes in comparison to the head shape. So a little bit unusual looking in terms of um, typical mice in the UK. And distinctively, they're quite um, dark, rich kind of orange in colour. There's a few people joining along the way, so I'm just going to let them in as we go. Um, so they're kind of an orange brown to russet colour. The youngsters are, are more kind of brown in colour and they get a deeper kind of orange colour as they grow, but they've got a pale belly, a uh, pale underside. Um, and they are the only mammal with a, pre a prehensile tail, which means that they can actually use their tail as almost a fifth limb and wrap around um, grass stalks and things and climb with the tail and hang from grass stalks with the tail. Dog wants to play now, so excuse the, the uh, disturbance. Um, they're incredibly acrobatic. So because they're so small and light, they actually inhabit a, a different ecological niche to a lot of our other uh, rodents. They're, they're out on grass stalks and they're up high in vegetation, feeding and moving around on very light vegetation. So um, why do we need to conserve them? Um, it's not a good story with harvest mice, but it's a bit of an uncertain story with harvest mice nationally. They've been put on the National Biodiversity Action Plan because it's thought that they have undergone very um, fast declines or very severe declines over the last kind of 40, 50 years. Um, and in London itself, they're, they're considered a rarity. They've only been recorded in six boroughs in London since 1996. And all of those were on the outskirts of London. Um, so they're not a very widespread or common uh, species in London, we think. The problem with surveying them um, is that they are quite difficult to find. Um, they're difficult to detect and people haven't been out there detecting them um, in general. Um, so it's hard to kind of quantify what kind of populations we, we have had historically and what kind of declines they've had. But where they have been surveyed, it has been found in a lot of places that they're absent. Um, or much reduced in number, or possibly even just isolated to very small local populations throughout their former range. And their range is generally from Northern England to Southern England. So um, from Yorkshire down to the South Coast, um, patchy in some places or absent in some areas of England, virtually absent in Scotland, they're thought to be. And in the few pockets of areas where they occur in Wales, um, it's thought to be due to introduction or reintroduction um, of the species. They're not widespread in Wales. Um, so lots of lots of their kind of contraction of their or former range has gone on in the past few decades. And um, why is that? Well, it's like with nature, you know, the country over, uh, basically the same story exists about kind of changes in land use since industrial agriculture came into play. Um, we have, you know, mm -hmm. on a large scale, completely mm -hmm. obliterated um, kind of wilder spaces for nature. And we've lost a lot of connectivity for nature and for wildlife 
and our biodiversity to move from one area to the next or to expand their range. And when we start cutting up the countryside into areas that are not as hospitable for species that rely on the kind of unkempt corners, um, we start to make it very, very hard for them when they come under pressure um, on a local level. And as, as soon as we start fragmenting populations, um, we start making it more and more difficult for them and they die out locally and then they, their range um, kind of contracts. So things like land drainage, um, harvest mice will talk about their, their specific habitat needs in a minute, but land drainage is one thing that has been kind of widespread in, in agricultural land especially. And they do rely on kind of the, the wet ditches, um, sometimes reed beds and, and uh, ditches and dikes and things like that as well. So that's been a problem. Tidying up in general, you know, um, on farmland and in our countryside, taking out those kind of messy, scruffy corners that are unproductive and pushing our productive land up to the very margins and up to the hedgerow margins and things has actually left um, or obliterated a lot of space for the, the creatures that rely on that kind of messy habitat. We think that climate change may be an impact because actually harvest mice being such a tiny little species are very prone to, um, to kind of population crashes due to bad weather. So very, very cold weather for um, prolonged periods. Uh, very wet weather as well for prolonged periods is um, actually known to cause population crashes on a, a local level. And again, if they're in very small patches or isolated island populations, um, a hard winter can actually wipe the, the population out effectively, only leaving a few individuals left to recolonize the following spring. Um, locally in Ealing, we don't really know actually if we have harvest mice or not. Um, I couldn't find any records of them, apart from um, David Howden at the Selborne Society, um, who operates uh, out of Perryvale Wood Local Nature Reserve, um, has said that there are some records from the Selborne Society dating back to the late 1970s or early 80s um, on the periphery of the, the uh, Perryvale Wood Reserve. And the, th the thought at the time was that they were coming in from the railway embankments, which was kind of, you know, wilder, um, more unkempt kind of grassland habitat. Um, and marginal kind of hedgerow habitat. So uh, we don't know at the moment if we have harvest mice left in the borough of Ealing. I would very much doubt it, but you know what, they could be out there. So we need to try and find out. Um, and we'll be talking about that in a second. Um, in terms of their favorite habitats, um, the kind of classic image that we see of um, harvest mice, welcome Emma, welcome um, some of you joiners now. Um, the classic, imagery we see of harvest mice is always the harvest mouse, you know, sitting on an ear of wheat, an ear of barley, an ear of um, corn. And um, that is a little bit, of a little bit of a misnomer. Um, Anita, I might just ask you to pop your thing on mute, if that's okay. <laughs> You're all right, don't worry. Uh, just a little oh, bit of background noise. Um, we'll get you to, to, to talk later for sure, Anita. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the classic image of harvest mice, they're often photographed and um, they're often photographed actually on a stage or on a set, um, you know, in captivity or wild mice are kind of put in a, a kind of a studio set up to, to, to photograph them because they're very tiny and they move very fast and they're hard to find to be able to photograph in the wild. And very often they're on some dried uh, wheat or barley or some other cereal grains. Now that's not, um, you know, although they're found in kind of arable crops and things like that, and that's probably part of the reason they were called harvest mice is that they were often seen at harvest time when people were bringing in those cereal crops and thrashing the grain and things like that and they would see harvest mice coming out of the crop. That's not their only habitat so it tends to be kind of overrepresented in how they are represented in photography at least. The main thing they want is tall grass and yes, cereal crops are a grass-like uh, plant. So they do like tall grass and it can be a mixture of species, but native kind of messy tussocky grass um, areas um, and reed beds actually are um, their two main kind of natural habitats. Arable crops came much later than, than harvest mice evolved. Um, so really what they want is rough unmown grassland um, where a thatch layer or a dead layer of grass is allowed to accumulate in the base layer of the grass each winter. It's not mown each year, the, the, the hay or the crop isn't taken off every year, leaving a very bare field. They want to have a thick dead layer in the, in the thatch underneath the grass and that provides them with a lot of cover, especially over winter when the vegetation is dying back. It's a very similar picture for field voles. Um, they like the exact same, they tunnel amongst that dead thatch layer in the grass 
Um, and uh, both of those species, field vole and harvest mouse, are very important species for things like barn owls and kestrels in terms of food items. Um, sorry, the dog is having a little uh, play here. Um, so uh, in agricultural land, what they want is they want space to be able to thrive, to be able to make their nests, to escape the, uh, the ravages, I suppose, of the harvest machines, the combine harvesters and things at harvest time. So ideally, they want to live in agricultural fields, um, if it is agricultural land, with wide, uncultivated and unsprayed field margins. So leaving a little bit of marginal land along um, the hedgerows and uh, allowing a strip, several meters ideally, of um, kind of rough grassland and wildflowers and weeds, as they say, to, to grow um, without the use of herbicides and, and pesticides. Um, that gives them the type of habitat they need, but also gives them the food supply they need because we're not poisoning um, the, the kind of plants and insects that, that should be growing there. But they will also colonize kind of uh, marge, the margins of woodland and hedgerows are a very important wildlife corridor for them to get around in the kind of agricultural landscape as well. Um, scrub with bramble, as long as there's kind of grassy edges and, and bramble, that's a, a habitat they really like as well. So they just want a, a variety of plant species and, and grassland to um, to inhabit, but bramble kind of hedgerow and woodland edge are very good um, linear habitats for harvest mice to colonize and to spread amongst um, the landscape as well. As I said at the start, dikes, wet ditches and reed beds are very important for them because they all kind of have a, a kind of mosaic of different grass species. Um, and salt marshes historically have held uh, good numbers of harvest mice as well. We don't have any salt marshes in Ealing though, so uh, that one's out. Um, these are kind of examples that I found um, online of where harvest mice are thriving. Um, the Devon Wildlife Trust shows this area um, and it's someone's farm where they have just left some messy margins, the, some awkward patches or, or awkward corners of fields that don't need to be um, kind of ploughed up and, and planted with crops or are not very good for um, kind of uh, livestock grazing and things, little patches that they have and also quite intact hedgerows for harvest mice to move from one area to the other. But this is the classic tussocky grass um, with various native species of grass like coxfoot and, and other species that um, provide that uh, stalk zone, so high stalk zone and a, a dense kind of dead thatch layer in the base for them to shelter in in the winter time, along with the good kind of natural hedgerows that aren't flailed to within an inch of their life like many farmers do. Um, this is a classic nest of a harvest mouse in that kind of um, that border or intermediate habitat between the uh, field um, edge and kind of getting into kind of bramble thicket or, or a hedgerow. You can see there it's a, it's a woven grass nest in the middle of the stalk layer of, of dead grass and, and brambles. We'll talk about the nests in more detail in a second. Um, these are the, some of the nests. Um, this one on the left is from a, a group um, called farmerclusters.com, which are a group of farmers nationwide that are trying to um, farm in a way that's more sensitive and more kind of sympathetic to nature and conservation and, and biodiversity. And somewhat surprisingly, this is exactly the type of field I'm talking about that I said isn't very suitable for harvest mice because it has been cultivated right up to the very edge of the hedgerow. And the hedgerow them itself, you know, you can see there by the kind of um, foreground, the ivy and the, the kind of hedgerow shrub species have been flailed and are very much manicured and, and chopped. Um, but you can see in the base layer of that hedge, there's a lot of grass that hasn't been cut um, and it's built up that kind of dead thatch layer and the dead uh, vegetation stalk zone as well that they like. And this farmer has found several um, harvest nests, harvest mouse nests. In, um, in his hedgerows. Hopefully some of the fields and areas of his farm are left a bit more fallow and less cultivated and that will hold a reservoir of, of the population that can colonize his hedgerows as well. And then uh, one of the flagship rewilding projects in the UK, Nep Estate down in West Sussex, has seen an absolute boom in harvest mice numbers um, since they started letting their farmland go back to nature and um, not doing anything with it. They've really taken an extreme approach to rewilding in terms of stepping off the land and not doing very much management at all. And they've seen harvest mice boom in their kind of um, long grass, uh, grass fields, areas where there's not such intensive grazing by their herbivores and specifically around their, their wetlands. Um, in the kind of margins of their wetlands and reed beds, they've seen harvest mice boom um, 
So uh, they're doing really, really well down there. But you can see the nest is like about a tennis ball size or slightly bigger, and it's woven out of the grass um, species that they're living in at the time. So in terms of behavior, they're a um, very active little creature. They're climbers. They're feeding up in the stalk zone of the grass. So in the wintertime, although both of them, uh, the, the harvest mouse and field vole, can be living kind of side by side and both kind of coexisting in the kind of dead hatch layer of, of rough grassland, if that's the habitat available to them. In the kind of um, growing season for the grass, the harvest mice are up in the stalk zone. So they've kind of separated themselves in terms of where they feed from the kind of field vole in, on the ground below. Um, they're what's called crepuscular, so they come out mainly at dusk and dawn, and they will obviously be uh, a little bit nocturnal as well, but they're not out during the day, basically. They wait until it's starting to get dark or um, just um, kind of uh, when dawn is coming, and that's when they're most active. They're very, very alert to sound, so their sense of hearing is, is what they're relying on because they are prey to a lot of other species, and if they hear something coming along, um, their defense mechanism basically is to pause, listen, and drop into the base layer of the vegetation below and scurry off to, to safety if they can. The, uh, the kind of way around that, if you're a, a predator, the, uh, the barn owl is the one that has mastered it. And um, the dog is chasing a little ball now. <laughs> I didn't want to take her toys away while I'm, while I'm doing this, so excuse the noise. But um, if you're a barn owl, you've kind of evolved alongside your prey um, being alert to sound and you've evolved feathers and wings that are very silent and you can drift over a, a grassland or a meadow and um, and drop down on your unsuspecting prey if they can't hear you. So they, they, they're very important um, prey species for barn owls. As I said, because they're so tiny, they've got a very high surface area to their body volume um, or their weight and that means they lose heat very quickly. It also means they have a very high met metabolic rate. Um, and that means that they are very prone to shortages in food or extremes of temperature. So very hard winters, as I said, can um, really dent the population quite a lot. Um, the prehensile tail that I talked about at the start is the thing that allows them to climb really out to the very edge of very fine grasses and feed on the seed heads of grasses and things. So um, that's the thing that sets them apart and gives them that ecological niche. No other rodent is taking advantage of that um, kind of um, seed, seed head and stalk zone of, of grasses while they're growing and ripening. Um, so in terms of surveying for them and looking for them, you know, it is very much a, a needle in a haystack job if you're going out looking for the mice themselves. Um, they're absolutely tiny. They will hear you coming. They'll drop down into vegetation and you're very unlikely to, to see one um, unless you're actively looking for them. But the, the obvious sign of their presence is the presence of these nests. And it's important to say that they weave the nests from living grasses. So they will actually, you know, at the start of the year, build a new nest and they will weave it from the grass that's already growing and they won't sever the stalk from the, the growing grass. So actually the, the nest becomes extremely well camouflaged because the nest is a living structure. So in, in kind of spring and summertime when the grass is green, you're looking for a woven ball of green grass in amongst lush growing grass and it can be very hard to find because it's super camouflaged and you really need to get your eye in to, to be able to, to pick that out in a, a, you know, acres and acres of, of grassland. Um, it's found as well, not just in grassland, but it can be found in dense vegetation. So sometimes you'll find it in a bramble thicket and they may use some dead kind of vegetation to, to weave it in amongst the bramble thicket as well. It's about as small as a kind of satsuma orange or um, up to tennis ball size or slightly larger. Um, as I say, very well camouflaged. In grassland, it tends to be off the floor, off the ground. So about 30 centimeters to 50 centimeters off the ground. Um, so it can be quite high up. And in reed beds, actually, it can be surprisingly high. It can be up to a meter, or even in some cases, it's been found almost at head height um, in, in reed beds, but generally about a meter off the ground in reed beds. Um, so kind of difficult um, to find and, and taking your eyes off the, the kind of ground as you're looking is uh, really important as well when you're surveying. Um, quite distinctively as well, it can look like a ball and you kind of can think, oh, it's not a nest because I can't see an entrance to it. But actually what they will do, because it's living, it's quite friable and they will go into the nest and then they will seal up the hole again and kind of seal themselves inside by kind of fiddling with the, the grass arrangements. So it doesn't have a distinctive hole like say a wren's nest or something would have for the bird to go into. It's actually just a living ball of grass and the harvest mouse will be inside and it will close it up as it leaves and as it um, enters the nest. 
Um, breeding nests can be a little bit bigger, up to 10 centimeters in diameter. In terms of diet, um, they're omnivores, so they mainly eat seeds, berries, and um, a few insects as well. So they're kind of an opportunist, they're an omnivore, they'll eat what they can find in those kind of habitats. And um, they'll sometimes consume fungi, um, moss roots, and, and occasionally some kind of fresh um, herbage um, or plant material. They don't do notable damage to cereal crops, even when they're found in high numbers in arable fields. They're not a, an agricultural pest as such because they're so tiny. Um, but where they do nibble grains or cereals and they have a characteristic sickle shape um, damage to the, to the grain itself. Um, and that's what you find um, when they're nibbling grains. Um, I talked about their high kind of surface area to volume, so the high metabolism, therefore they have high energy demands. So they need to feed all year round, every day, um, quite a significant um, volume of food to keep them going. Um, threats and predators. One of the threats they face is competition from other, other rodent species. So that can be competition for resources like food um, and kind of safe habitat to use. If there's a high density of um, wood mice or field voles, there can be a, a de decrease in harvest mice because they don't compete as well. But actually there can be some surprisingly direct predation by um, wood mice and field voles. Wood mice more so. Um, a, a wood mouse, if it comes across a harvest mouse nest, especially in the spring and summer breeding season, and it has hungry young to feed, it won't hesitate to eat um, a, um, a litter of harvest mouse babies. So wood mice are omnivores too, and a tiny little baby harvest mouse is not that much different to a grasshopper or something that a wood mouse would take opportunistically to boost its protein levels. So there can be some interaction and some um, predation even from wood mice and field voles. But if you have the right diversity and mosaic of habitats, all three species can um, coexist uh, quite well. Predators, they are you know, our smallest rodents. So it's no surprise really that actually every predator you can name in the, the British kind of grassland, woodland ecosystem will eat a harvest mouse um, you know, if it's big enough. So starting with the smallest kind of things like weasels and stoats, um, kestrels, owls, herons, um, snakes, grass snakes and adders will take them. Um, foxes, cats are a big problem with all of our um, kind of native wildlife. And again, if you have pressure on a population of a, a vulnerable um, animal like a harvest mouse and it only exists in fairly small numbers or in an isolated island population, and there is, you know, a moggy that's a very good hunter and goes out there every night of the week um, looking for mice and voles and shrews, it can wipe out the harvest mouse population in that area if it's an island population. So cats are a big problem. Um, crows, even pheasants, basically anything that is a, an opportunistic omnivore or um, carnivore in our ecosystem will take harvest mice. But that's not bad news in, in itself. I think we need to think about these things holistically and think about ecosystems on a larger level. We're not talking about potentially reintrodu reintroducing harvest mice to have as many harvest mice as we can and protect them at all costs. One of the reasons that we want harvest mice back in our ecosystems is that they do, they are the base layer of the food chain. And if we've eliminated one of the important species in the base layer of a food chain, unfortunately that has knock on effects on all of the biodiversity and all the species further up the food chain that rely on that directly or indirectly. So we do want to uh, reintroduce harvest mice to put back something that we've um, unfortunately lost. Um, and the benefits of that is that other biodiversity will do well um, with that kind of extra layer in the food chain for them. Um, so one of the uh, projects that we've been working on over the last two years is our owl conservation project and specifically looking at our target species barn owl. Um, we know that the harvest mouse in other areas of the country is a favoured prey of barn owls. Um, so that is one of the reasons that we would like to focus on um, harvest mice as our, our first reintroduction project. Um, We've seen that we have had barn owls visiting several of our owl nest boxes, um, but our nest boxes to provide breeding um, sites for them are only one part of the picture. The other part of the picture is providing enough feeding grounds for barn owls and our other species like little owl and tawny owl to thrive, because if they can't feed over a wider landscape, they're not gonna be able to raise chicks in those nest boxes. Um, and uh, we have had, um, as I say, barn owls using some of our boxes. So uh, it would be really great actually to, to kind of bring back harvest mice into the areas where we're changing grassland management, trying to encourage field voles already, and we're creating habitat that is actually tailor-made for harvest mice as well. 
Um, and then finally, as I said already, hard winters, wet weather is the kind of final threat to, to harvest mouse populations. Generally see with rodent populations, field voles being a classic example, boom and bust cycles. So you will have good years where the conditions are right and where the population from the previous year has built up to a good level, where you actually get an explosion of vole numbers. And with that explosion of vole numbers, you get very good years for birds of prey like barn owls and kestrels because there's an abundance of food for their chicks to raise. So the prey and predator cycle goes in tandem with each other. Um, in the good years, uh, the, the birds of prey and the other um, predators do very well. And then it, sometimes you get a bust year where just conditions aren't right in the previous season um, or the very hard winter knocks them back and you get a very poor vole year and then you get uh, more breeding failure of things like barn owls and kestrels. The same is true with harvest mice but it's adding another kind of safety net by putting another species into their um, potential feeding, feeding um, supply. Um, and this I'll just show you, some of you may have seen this already, but this is just some footage of um, some of the owls using our nest boxes. This is a, a little owl who didn't get the memo and is using a barn owl box. And here is one of the barn owls um, just scoping out one of our boxes last um, February, kind of January, February time. Um, 20th of February that was. So we do have barn owls in the area. We really want to encourage them in. But as I say, nest boxes are only one part of the picture. We need to think about feeding area and um, what they're feeding on and I think if we can bring back another species into what they're feeding on that's a good idea. How they reproduce and how much they reproduce they are a rodent so it's no surprise that they can uh, reproduce quite quickly with the right conditions. They normally have between two and three litters of young per year in the wild. Um, their gestation period is um, 17 to 19 days so very very quick pregnancy and normally give birth to between three and eight pups. Um, six is about average the young are weaned very quickly in as little as two weeks and they're independent in as little as three weeks. So very, very quick the, the mother can turn around an entire litter of, of new um, harvest mice. And they breed between kind of May and October. So once the weather gets a little bit milder and the kind of chances of frost are, are passed, that's when they start breeding and their peak breeding season is in August normally. Um, remarkably, the young can be uh, sexually mature in as little as six weeks. So you imagine in a good year, you get a rapid, rapid increase in the, the overall number, the overall population in an area, if conditions are good and if the habitat is there for them. And if the habitat connectivity is there for them, then it is a species that can actually do very well and start to spread itself across those habitats. Um, in terms of captive breeding, and we do see with reintroduction projects of harvest mice, that captive breeding of, um, of harvest mice for release is a very good way to boost the kind of wild population over time and um, really make a, a success of the, the program in general. And with the right management, um, they can be quite prolific in, in, um, in captivity as well for breeding. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And that's maybe where some of you might come in as well, helping us with a captive breeding program if we go ahead. Um, People are asking, you know, why a reintroduction project? Why do you want to, you know, start kind of doing rewilding and eeling or bringing back species that we don't have currently? You know, um, do we have the right habitat for them? You know, if, if they're not here now, then why would you kind of consider they should be? Um, and I would say that starting from, you know, the very basic facts are that unfortunately Britain is now one of the most nature depleted nations in the world. Um, and we've been kind of struggling on with kind of traditional conservation methods and, and trying to maintain certain habitats with very high management approaches for a lot um, of the time and kind of targeting our, our conservation approaches on certain species or certain habitat types um, for a long time. But rewilding um, in general is about actually letting nature do what it needs to do. And part of rewilding actually is replacing the species that, that we lost. Um, or that we got rid of um, in habitats. Um, and I would say, you know, if we got rid of something, um, it's probably our duty to try and put it back or try and um, remedy that because, um, you know, we kind of did it in ignorance a lot of the time or we didn't realize the repercussions of what we were doing in terms of land management uh, some time ago. Um, I think it's likely, quite likely, that harvest mice are locally extinct in um, Ealing. I am going to be delighted if I'm surprised and proved otherwise, but I think it's pretty likely they are locally extinct. And I think we should remedy that if, um, if we've caused it. 
Um, it's really important as well, you know, with a, a species that has declined nationally and has been constricted in terms of its, uh, its former range, that we try and create reservoir uh, populations of these species where the habitat is now suitable again. Um, because, you know, if they're wiped out further, we need to have those reservoir pools of um, genetics and of populations that, that further reintroduction projects can come from in the future. Um, I'd also be very, very honest in terms of why harvest mice, if we're talking about rewilding and eeling and why choose harvest mouse as the kind of uh, phase one project or phase one species. And I would say that they are a very um, enigmatic and um, adorable and cute and um, endearing species to a lot of people. Um, I think, um, you know, not many people can argue that they're a very, uh, very cute little species. And they'll capture the public's imagination. And I think part of uh, the, the role of um, kind of nature conservationists now is to try and reach new audiences and um, give out messages that actually inspire people to take an interest, number one, in their local green spaces and biodiversity, but also get involved. And a reintroduction project like this actually ticks all of those boxes in terms of capturing the community uh, interest. We had a journalist from Ealing Times call up earlier today for an interview because she heard about it on Facebook and was like, this is a brilliant story for Ealing. Um, so um, she's put out an article this evening. And I think it is something that actually can capture people's imagination. We've all had, I think you'll all agree, a pretty crap year. It'd be good to have some good news about a lost species being brought back. Um, and uh, as well as kind of engagement of community, um, it works very well alongside our owl conservation project um, and is a good way of teaching people that everything is connected in nature and what we do here can actually have knock-on benefits on wider biodiversity. And I think the ultimate question for me is here is, is there a good reason not to try bringing back um, harvest mice to healing? Um, I can't think of one. I'm all ears if, if any of you can. And um, we can definitely talk about that in the Q&A. Um, I just put in this little snippet of an article, uh, which was a very feel good story from earlier this year, or perhaps late last year. Um, I think it was in The Guardian where um, a student had a PhD student had tried to reintroduce harvest mice into kind of wetland areas um, in Northumberland and didn't really know if it had worked and kind of finished her PhD and then got reports from some students in the university 15 years later that actually there were tons of harvest mice there where there was none before. So over a long period of time, they were kind of quietly, you know, dominating this, these wetland areas and, and spreading. And a real good news story that actually her reintroduction project was a massive success, but it wasn't found out that it was until uh, 15 years later. So the first question to ask if we're going to do this is, do we have suitable sites? Um, what they need, just as a recap, is kind of those messy corners, those kind of what would be traditionally referred to on farmland as rank grass uh, land or corners, um, messy margins, really. Um, and crucially, coxfoot, another tussock forming grass species. Um, and we've actually, um, the rangers on Horsenden Hill have pushed back a lot of blackthorn scrub and actually sown a, a what's called an owl mix of, of grasses, which contain a lot of these um, favoured grasses of field folds and harvest mice um, along the field margins there. And they've actually, we've changed some of the grassland management to leave entire fields on Horsenden Hill and some other areas of the borough unmown. Because traditionally what um, the parks team have been doing is really prioritizing wildflowers in our meadow areas and then taking an annual cut of hay and, um, and grass off the, off the um, fields and taking it away to lower the nutrient level and to encourage the broadleaf plants and wildflowers to grow in amongst the grass. But actually, that's not a very good approach for creating the, the habitat needed for small mammals. And therefore, that may be the reason why barn owls and, and things are struggling to, to breed in Ealing. They just don't have the feeding habitat. So we've changed that. I can't remember, but we have hectares and hectares now of new, most new um, rough grassland forming, um, which would be good release sites. Um, so we'll talk about that in a sec. Reed beds, we've got reed beds. We've got a lot um, kind of off areas of the canal in Ealing, um, from Perryvale right down to Brentford all along the canal. Um, we've got lots of hedgerows and woodland edge and bramble scrub in various areas um, and it's, they're being managed by the parks team really well uh, to, in kind of a, a less traditional way to allow wilder areas to, to establish um, very much a hands-off approach in some areas that are creating really, really lovely habitat for, for this species. Um, canal sides and railway embankments are uh, tend to be 
very unmanaged by their very nature because you don't, people don't go on them and you know they've got a railway line in the middle which is quite dangerous and they tend to be fenced off um, but luckily for us rodents can get through fences so they tend to be quite a, gr a good linear habitat and wildlife corridor for a lot of species um, small and large um, to get around the borough as well so we think they will be um, very good uh, locations for them. One problem we have in urban environments obviously is habitat connectivity so it's no use having you know four areas of ideal habitat for a certain species we want to bring back if they're just going to exist in those little pockets um, in isolation and not be able to spread. So we need to think about connectivity as well and, and the ability of, of whatever animal we reintroduce to get around and sustain itself in terms of a wider population. Um, we need public support. Um, you know, if we had a massive backlash and bad PR around a harvest mouse reintroduction project, it would be surprising, but it could happen. Um, you know, that wouldn't be good news for the project, but we need public support in various ways. Um, one of the ways is that we need you guys as members and as people who are interested in nature conservation to get involved and to help us because we can't do it with just two or three people from Ealing Wildlife Group Committee. And we need our members to get involved because this will take um, people power basically to get out on the ground and start looking for them and start um, helping us with release sites and, and with the breeding program if we go along that route. Um, we want to do a bit of research and groundwork really to establish if we have them first. So that's the big thing. And that's something that we can start doing now is looking for um, their nests and signs of presence. Um, we also want to identify local sites that would be good for reintroducing them. And we want to engage all stakeholders from private landowners to Ealing Council. Uh, and pretty much I can tell you now they're um, on board um, that harvest mice, harvest mice should be a priority species in, um, in Ealing and in terms of how we manage our land, especially our grassland. And we're already on the, the right path with that. Um, but we also want to engage the wider community and um, potentially with the, par the project and surveying, but also potentially helping breeding mice. Um, so um, Elliot is here on, on the call um, from Citizen Zoo, which is a rewilding initiative. Um, we'll talk to Elliot, I hope, in a little bit when we finish at the Q&A. But Elliot is talking about, you know, the, the value of getting schools involved. And, you know, is there a, a possibility that school children might help to, to breed mice? Or would we have, you know, a, a um, what's the word, a harvest mouse mascot in every school to talk about the importance of food chains and conservation and habitat management for um, for biodiversity. So there's various ways that we can get the community involved in this. Um, the first thing is surveying. So here's the recruitment bit, guys. Um, I think all of you on this call are probably going out and walking in nature and walking in green spaces um, most days, if not most weeks at the moment. And what I would love for you to do is to actually start actively looking for harvest mice nests. So this is the time of year to be looking for them. Um, late autumn, early winter, when the vegetation has died back and, and is dead and the nests become a lot more prominent than they would be when they're living green structures amongst growing grass. Um, this is Lucy Groves from the NEP estate. She's the uh, project manager for the White Stork reintroduction project down at NEP, but she was involved for seven years on harvest mouse reintroduction um, projects all over the country for um, the uh, Durrell uh, conservation group I think um, on Jersey and um, she has had a look and I've talked to her in, at length about it and she's had a look at some of the habitat um, that we have in Ealing and she agrees it's absolutely perfect for a, a reintroduction project um, and she's willing to help us as well so what you want to do is find suitable habitat um, which we've talked about you know rough grassland grassy margins messy messy margins um, reed bed um, bramble thickets things like that and get out and maybe with it's kind of quite useful to have a stick or something and just start parting the vegetation and looking for those distinctive tennis ball size woven grass nests um, which will blend in you need to get your eye in um, I was told it's, it's easier to do it on a dull or overcast day because you don't have the glare and the, the nest can tend to stand out a little bit better with some shadow in the in the grass um, but once you get your eye in and if you find some I think you'll you'll become a hero for us because You'll be, uh, you'll be very good at, at spotting them once you see your first one or two. Um, again, as I say, I, I don't know that we will find them. I would be absolutely delighted if we did, but um, it would be good to kind of um, get people on the ground out looking um, now. Um, so it'd be great to get you to come forward on that. 
Um, it would also be good to coordinate to some extent, you know, if people are willing to do this, let us know you're willing to do it and let us know the areas that you're going to kind of survey or cover just very informally. You won't be held to account or, you know, said, kind of chased on how many times have you surveyed and how long did you do it for and which specific areas. But it'd just be good to know who's kind of covering what area and that way people aren't doubling up and things like that. Um, so as I said, I think I've covered everything in terms of how to um, recognize and identify a harvest mouse nest. The classic things are it's about tennis ball size. It's woven amongst, in, it's woven with the, the grass um, surrounding it and it doesn't necessarily have a nest hole because it'll be um, covered up. We don't want anyone touching or removing the nests if they look like they're very solid. If they're very much broken down and there's obviously nothing in them or they're a bit split open, you can take them out and have a look at them in your hand. But um, the best thing to do is take multiple photos of them on your phone if you can, and maybe some video footage like moving around it as well, just so we can get a good idea of whether it is or isn't a harvest mouse nest. Um, they're very distinctive. So I think if you find one, you'll, you'll know. Um, but yeah, don't, don't disturb them if, um, if in case they are active. Um, right now, we're not going to do a very detailed, you know, survey technique or methodology or anything like that. Right now, if we're in the very early stages of seeing whether this is feasible or not, what we just want to establish is absence or presence of harvest mice. Um, and even if we say, you know, we don't think harvest mice are present in Ealing, we can't prove it because it's very hard to prove a negative. But if we find them, then that was a great place to kind of focus our energies and say, right, what is good about this little place? pocket where they're clinging on, um, how can we maybe manage other areas in a similar way? Because what they like in Ealing, we want to emulate if we do find them. Um, so really we need uh, citizen science and people out looking for them. Later on, uh, what we can do maybe is uh, kind of establish more um, detailed kind of survey methods and, um, and kind of come up with a, a better, more scientific um, way to, to monitor their populations as we go through this. Um, so we want you guys and um, kids especially, you know, it's not exclusive to um, nature nerd adults like all of us. Uh, I think getting kids involved and um, getting them out looking is quite a, a fun task for them um, to do. And I think, uh, you know, we could we could brand this up, you know, Ealing Mouseketeers or uh, something. I'm open to suggestions on um, how we could get uh, more kids involved. But I think it's a great activity for families to do if they're out for walks anyway. And um, this is just an example of what they've been doing at NEP um, and the kind of density of harvest mouse nests that they're finding on some of their surveys at NEP. Um, I'm going to play a little video, um, just watching time. Yeah, I'm going to play this little video. I'll skip through a little bit of it, but it's a, a very good video by Suffolk Wildlife Trust, where um, again, they started with, Bar with Barn Owl Conservation Project. Here uh, She's, uh, she's getting bored now, this little doggo. Um, but they started with a barn owl conservation project and then they moved, They started talking about whether they had harvest mice in certain areas and quite interesting survey methods they employed for, um, for determining whether harvest mice were present. Can you all see that playing, yeah? Good. Oh, I'm not sure I can hear it. We meant to get the volume. You can't hear it. Hang on. Uh, okay, one second. Uh, I'm up to full now. Let me see how that goes. No. No. When you shared your screen, did you share sound as well? I think that's probably the problem. What's that, Elliot? I think when you when you go to share screen, you have to click share sound as well. Okay, let me see. I'm just going to stop sharing screen for a second, and then I'll do it because I think there was a, a tick box on that. Hang on, one second. Optimize screen sharing for a video clip. Yeah. Hello, yeah. I'm Martha Cowell and um, I work for Suffolk Wildlife Trust and at the moment I'm working on a harvest mouse project. The project has been going for a year now 
and it's been incredibly successful. The project really came about because of the successes of the Suffolk Community Barn Owl project. What advisors have been doing is going around and advising landowners on putting up barn owl boxes and uh, it's led to a really big and excellent spread of barn owls into new areas. Simone Bullion, who is the uh, one of the conservation advisors at Suffolk Wildlife Trust, had a little brainwave of using all of these owl pellets, which are now distributed across the whole of Suffolk, to analyse and look for harvest mice remains. Um, and the reason that we really wanted to do this is because the harvest mouse has been made a biodiversity action plan species which means that it has gone down or declined in numbers so we thought oh okay so if this is a Suffolk's a really good stronghold for barn owls perhaps it's a good stronghold for harvest mice as well so we thought well let's see what happens and uh, set about collecting the owl pellets from all the boxes and uh, then we started to train volunteers to do the owl pellet analysis and uh, harvest mouse skulls started turning up in quite a few of the pellets. Uh, I mean the first few times we found one it was all excitement, oh I, wow we've got one, we've got one, where's it from, I wonder what the habitat's like and then suddenly they started turning up in more of the pellets until we realised that they were actually turning up in about 50% of all the sites which is excellent and more than we sort of hoped for really. <laughs> So this is a barn owl pellet, this is probably about an average size for a pellet. Um, this all this stuff on the outside is just where it's been sat on a dusty old floor. And for the harvest mouse nests. The way we did this was to go to the sites where we'd found the barn owl pellets. So, um, for example, if the barn owl was nesting in this barn, um, the ideal place to look would be here which is absolutely fantastic habitat for the harvest mouse. Um, this long tussocky grass um, is exactly what they like. About three years growth is ideal for the harvest mouse because what they like is a really nice thick structure at the base which keeps out um, predators but also probably one of the most important things it keeps out the rain um, because bad weather is one of the things that kills off most harvest mice. Um, one of the, the type of grass that we've been finding most nests in on this kind of arable landscape um, is this which is cocksfoot um, and you can identify easily even in winter which is very handy because that's when we're looking for nests because it has this um, this piece here which is why it's called a cocksfoot because of this um, looking like the tote. Okay so this um, is where I actually found a nest um, back in October and uh, you can just see it here it's hidden right in the grass it's actually quite obvious now compared to in uh, summer when it would be completely hidden under the tussock and if I just sort of hold the nest there behind my hand it makes it a lot easier easier to see so as you can see it's actually made out of the grass that's surrounding it so they're actually made out of um, living grasses really and um, suspended in the grass you can see the little entrance hole there um, in, when they're in use they actually don't have a hole to go in and out the mouse will actually close the hole behind them to keep predators out we think one of the reasons that harvest mice are probably doing well in Suffolk is that we've got quite a lot of habitat that's okay so um we'll stop it there and i'm just gonna go okay did you all you all heard heard that okay and kind of explained how to kind of get out and and survey for them yeah um so it's a good video if you want to um go and have a look at it yourself um and see it in more detail they talk about the type of habitats and they talk about the barn owl relationship with them and things but it just gives a good idea of what we need to be looking for um in the kind of right habitats um, in terms of reintroduction sites, uh, there's three things that we want these sites to be um, and do. We want them to be suitable habitat, obviously. We want them to be sustainable, so areas that are going to be managed um, correctly and uh, maybe not under threat of development would be good. And um, the third thing is connectivity. So we want them to be connected to other suitable sites so that we can build up a robust and sustainable population of harvest mice um, in Ealing. Uh, that will thrive and survive maybe patches of, of um, habitat being developed. So it's potentially uh, 40 years since Ealing recorded um, harvest mice. I forgot to say at the start, which is one of my favourite facts about harvest mice, is their scientific name is Micromus minutus. 
which means the minute micro mouse. So uh, they're doubly small. Um, so it's one of my favorite uh, kind of geek facts about harvest mice, their, their scientific name. Um, lots obviously has changed with management um, of uh, our green spaces and um, what we know. And I have to give a massive credit to the parks team from the council because they're very conservation focused and very much about increasing biodiversity in our green spaces nowadays compared to even kind of 10 or 15 years ago. So I would say we absolutely have suitable uh, habitat. So the first box is ticked and experts in harvest mouse reintroduction um, have been consulted and say the same. Do we have sustainable? I think we do in, in some areas and certainly um, in terms of how the green spaces are managed, we do have sustainable. Do we have connected maybe is a little bit harder um, and is one of the kind of problems always in an urban area. So what I've done is I've been out uh, stomping around for the last year. Um, I started looking at sites uh, mainly in terms of water voles because we've um, historically had water voles in Ealing and I wanted to start surveying areas for water voles. But much of the habitat, especially the wetland kind of habitat that's favoured by water voles or is favoured by harvest mice is the same type of habitat that water voles like as well. Um, and I've established uh, a few key areas that tick all of the boxes in terms of habitat and are somewhat connected by the canal here. So starting at Horston and West on the right hand side um, to Paradise Fields, down the canal to an area called Carr Road, which is a large mass of um, reed bed habitat just off the canal. Um, and then again, traveling down the canal kind of as a linear um, wildlife corridor to Marnham Fields and um, Smith's Farm um, adjacent to North Alla Fields. These five areas, I think, are kind of key um, areas that I would say, if we're gonna do this, we focus phase one of the reintroduction project on this kind of belt and those five key areas trying to build up um, harvest mouse populations in them could be a very good starting point for a thriving population. Just go through them very quickly. Um, Horsenden and West is um, across the Horsenden and Lane from Horsenden and Farm, um, and it has a diversity of habitats, much of which we've changed the management of to attract in barn owls. It's one of the sites where we have two barn owl boxes. We know there are little owls there as well, um, but it's got all of the, the kind of um, habitats from reed bed and canal side uh, ponds um, with surrounding kind of vegetation, scrub, bramble thickets, through to the rough grassland being managed for field voles and barn owls, um, as well as your woodland edge, um, your bramble thickets, your dense, um, well-managed or unmanaged hedgerows um, that, that give a, a variety of different vegetation types. Whitler's Wood as well, which is a community planted um, new woodland, looks very good at the moment, obviously will change over time as those trees grow into kind of more mature woodland, but at the moment it's perfect for um, harvest mice. Una, I'll, um, I'll share a map, um, I think it's at the end, um, but this is the map that I've just uh, done kind of for, for ease at the moment, but we can share a map at the end for sure. Um, I see there's quite a few comments coming in, so I will um, have a look at those as we go as well. So Horson and West, I think is it's the biggest expanse, if you look on the map, um, of um, kind of suitable habitat and diverse kind of habitat. So we could see that as a starting point and see where the harvest mice are preferring themselves. Um, and then adjacent to that across the canal is Paradise Fields, which is an area with um, a lot of rough grassland, a lot of kind of, um, kind of uh, rough kind of meadow areas. There's not annual cuts on that. There's um, some of it turning into scrub um, and there's several lagoons and ponds in there and um, kind of um, almost canal uh, type um, wetlands coming from the canal to connect, interconnect those lagoons with um, plenty of dense vegetation along them as well. So that that is one of the areas that historically has had signs of water voles, um, but it's also an area that has suitable habitat for, um, for harvest mice. The third one is Carr Road, which as I said is uh, a dense kind of reed bed area, one of our largest areas of reed bed in the borough. Um, and I went there early this year at the start of lockdown for my daily hour permitted exercise quite a bit to set camera traps and to try and find water bowls. Unfortunately, I didn't find any water bowls there. Um, and we think actually that it's actually become a little bit too dry for water bowls. Um, there was uh, potentially some leakage from um, a water main in that site that was keeping it very, very wet that has since been sealed up. And unfortunately, it's more of a dry reed bed now than kind of open water in the middle. So we don't think we have water voles there, but it could be a good location again for harvest mice. Um, Marnham Fields, I hadn't been there until very recently. I, I got a, I was talking to someone about it and I decided to go down and have a look. And again, looking at this dense tussocky grass, um, lots of bramble thickets, lots of um, kind of woodland edge and scrub edge 
um, I think would be good habitat as well. And the same kind of thing at Smith's Farm, which also has various um, ponds and pools and reed bed uh, um, amongst the kind of uh, grassland. Phase two, you know, um, I think there's another kind of green belt in Ealing, which is the Brent River Park. Um, the problem I see with the Brent River Park is that it has a few areas of suitable habitat, but they're quite isolated or quite fragmented. So Warren Farm, Elthorne Rough and some isolated reed bed patches um, in that kind of green belt um, down kind of bisecting Ealing north to west. Um, it has suitable, it maybe doesn't have sustainable if you think about Warren Farm and what the future holds for that. I'm not sure that's such a sustainable site for a reintroduction project and connectivity is, is um, a problem there. Um, so I would kind of argue that maybe instead of just focusing on the borough of Ealing, could we look outwards and look at, um, oh, you're not seeing the screen. Sorry, guys. Hang on. I thought I changed that. Now it makes sense, Una, that you asked uh, to see the map. Sorry, I'm going to just quickly go back on those uh, those ones I showed. Um, so reintroduction sites, I think this is where we started back. They need to be suitable, sustainable and connected. Um, these are the five areas. So Horsenden West, you can all see it now, yeah? Um, Horsenden West in the right of the of the map, um, Paradise Fields directly across the canal from there. We'll have to maybe build a few tiny harvest mouse bridges across the canal. Um, I know there's a few places they can cross anyway. Um, and then heading down the canal, which acts as a good wildlife corridor to Carr Road, and then further down the canal to Marnham Fields and um, Smith's Farm adjacent to North Olive Fields. So that's the kind of habitat we're to look, talking about at Horson and West, where we have the owl boxes and the grassland management for specifically for field voles. And which would also suit um, harvest mice as well. Um, Whitler's wood there is in the bottom right, um, which is currently good for, for harvest mice, I think, but will change. This is Paradise Fields with its series of lagoons and canals coming off the canal um, on the opposite side to Horseman West. Um, this is Carr Road where I was doing surveying for, for water voles amongst a few other places. Uh, didn't find any, but again, perfect habitat for harvest mice if we went that way. This is Marnham Fields and this is Smith's Farm. So we do have suitable and sustainable. Um, I'm not sure we have um, connected in some areas. And this is one. So this is the Brent River Park, um, kind of going north to south in Ealing. And although, as I say, we've got um, areas like Warren Farm here in the bottom, um, we all know the saga of threat of development of Warren Farm. So it wouldn't likely be ticking the sustainable box for reintroducing or risking reintroducing a species like a harvest mouse in an isolated pocket like that. Um, maybe further up, there's a couple of areas, but again, it's not the best. So I think getting back to where I, um, where I left off, connecting maybe with some of our neighboring boroughs with suitable habitat would be a better option than trying to kind of force a, a reintroduction project into a habitat that doesn't tick those sustainable, connected and um, suitable um, boxes. Um, in terms of obtaining mice, I've already been on it. I've talked to um, a few people who are involved in the rewilding space and um, are kind of um, breeding um, wild harvest mice, native harvest mice for reintroduction projects. So we can obtain them pretty easily. You can actually go out and obtain some tomorrow. Uh, there are harvest mice for sale online. Some people are keeping them, excuse me, as pets. Um, but we want to be very careful about the genetics and um, that we're not starting with a kind of a, an inbred um, population that's been in captivity a long time and things. So what we want to do is have um, a good genetic diversity for our founder population because uh, we don't want to start with limited genetics um, that can cause problems down the line. Um, expense involved. I don't think it's very expensive to do this project. I think like 1500 to 2000 pounds as a starting point would get us a good number of, um, of harvest mice to, to release. Um, it would also give us some um, equipment and housing to start our own captive breeding project um, going forward. They're not expensive to keep. Um, there's a little bit of management involved, but there's not, it's not expensive really to, um, to keep once you get them set up. Um, properly. So ideally we would have a two-pronged approach. First is buying and releasing large founder groups in suitable habitat in spring or summer ideally to give them a chance to breed themselves um, and secondly establish a captive breeding pro program to um, continue that release um, over the next two or three years and, and boost the, the population in the wild. In terms of breeding them they are relatively easy to establish um, thriving breeding colonies. Um, they are a rodent so they're quite productive uh, and uh, they have a rapid reproductive rate um, but it, their natural history means they do require a relatively high touch approach 
um, in terms of rodents or compared to other rodents because um, they've got a competitive mode of reproduction. So um, putting a group of mice together, what you'll find is that stimulates a dominant pair to form and start ousting all of the other mice and form a breeding pair. So you do need numbers of them and you need to be moving the non-dominant ones out and keeping dominant pairs together. So there's a little bit of um, kind of trickery or management, I suppose, in getting them to start breeding and start forming pairs and um, moving them around. They can be quite aggressive as well and um, when they're breeding and territorial. Elliot might talk to us in a little bit about that. He has direct experience. Um, so it requires a bit of moving of individuals and groups and um, segregating the juveniles before they're you know, um, sexually mature at six weeks old and, and releasing them. It's easy and fun uh, when you know how, and I think it will be a brilliant project to get, again, kids involved, schools, scouts, um, all sorts to get them involved. Emma Woods with her forest school there is beaming and thinks, this is a great idea. Am I right, Emma? <laughs> yeah, I can see, uh, you can see plans hatching in, in people's minds here, which is great. Um, in terms of releasing them then into the wild, I know we're running fairly short on time, but we want to have kind of soft release stations sometimes. We don't want to just chuck out 30 mice into the one area and hope for the best. Um, ideally, what we do is just set up temporary kind of um, pens or light enclosures just just give them a bit of uh, a bit of protection from predators and um, when we first release them out and allow them to disperse into the landscape um, when we're doing a mass release if we're buying large numbers of them to start this off and um, we need to plan it quite well um, and we need public education I think it's really important to bring people in passers by you know um, if you put up a, a little enclosure or pen or as we found out, a camera trap or something in the in the public uh, and people passing by don't know what it is. Very often they might interfere or investigate or tamper or even steal. So I think actually being very open and, and providing kind of um, education about what we're doing is really important to get people behind it and, and um, get everyone involved and give a sense of ownership of it. Um, when we're in peak breeding season, I suppose, and if we're getting a captive breeding population on uh, going on the go, um, we would likely need a weekly program of, of releasing as well because they're going to be producing lots and lots of um, babies over time. So that's where volunteer power comes in as well. Um, this bit, I'll just play again a little clip of it. Um, so I'll, I'll share in the right way in a second so you can hear it. Um, take this with a, a little bit of a pinch of salt. I think it was on the one, yeah, the one show. Um, it's a little bit twee at times in terms of, you know, kind of how they're uh, describing the, the release, but it just shows um, a, a conservationist who's been breeding and releasing harvest mice for quite some time. So I'm just going to stop sharing and um, turn the sound on for a second. Again. Farming is a way of life. It's a job and it provides a vital source of food that, for the yeah. nation. But just stop still for a moment and there's much more than that going on around here. Just out of sight, countless insects, mammals and birds live in these fields. Among them, the emblem of the summer, the harvest mouse. These tiny creatures got their name because they traditionally nested in crops and used to be commonly seen at harvest time. But now they live on the brink. Because when the combine harvesters arrive, the mice, the nests and everything else in their path faces destruction. It's a big deal because a quarter of the British countryside is arable. David Mills from the British Wildlife Centre in Surrey used to be a farmer. He says our harvest mice are particularly hard hit. Years ago, when there was the old reaper and binder, when the stooks of corn were brought in in sort of early September, uh, they were brought into the farmyard and made into a rick. Then the harvest mice would come in with them, obviously, because they'd be in the corn, and they would overwinter in these corn ricks. But today, the harvest is so much earlier, and you've got this big modern machinery. So in the past, they were just given lots and lots of places to shelter, lots of opportunities to survive and thrive. It's all about loss of habitat. It's not just the harvest mice, of course. It's all the other animals as well. The impact on harvest mice has been so serious that they've been added to a government list of animals at risk. And farmers now get funding to create refuges for small mammals at harvest time. The good news is that simple practices by farmers can really make a difference. Like leaving these margins of uncultivated wild grasses and weeds by the side of the fields. Now these give insects and small mammals a place to eat and a place to shelter. And that in turn helps the bigger animals like the barn owls as well. 
and we can artificially boost the populations of some tiny mammals. David runs a project right. to breed harvest mice in captivity and release them into the wild. He's asked me to help. Right, so whereabouts do you normally release them? Uh, normally on the edge of cornfields where there's plenty of cover uh, because they need to be on the edge where they can find shelter and right. food, of course. They'll, they'll make their nests in here. They come out of the corn when the combine starts and they'll live in here. Right, so the big, big moment for release. And you're just going to put it... Just going to put it on there. Oh, lovely. There you go. <gasps> and how old are these mice? Uh, these are juveniles. These are about five weeks old. They will start breeding when they're six weeks old, six to seven weeks. And they could easily have two, if not three litters, before the weather turns nasty, sort of in October time. Can I have a go? <laughs> Please do. Just Grabbing take, one. take it by the tail. Yep. There you go. Mind you don't get bitten. <laughs> I'm just going to put him there. Little chap. Off you go. So that's, um, as I say, a little bit twee about like farming and farmland being their only habitat and they're just a threatened species. I'm just going to share my screen again so you can see. Um, but it just shows that actually, you know, you can um, release them and uh, build up their numbers. Okay. Can you all see my screen again? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so after release, we wanna monitor if we're being successful, if we're building up numbers, if they're um, surviving in the landscape year on year. So um, the most sustainable method and most reliable method is still nest surveys. As I said at the start, they're hard to survey and hard to find the mice themselves. They don't tend to show up on traditional small mammal trapping um, like we've, uh, we can do with kind of long worth traps, so mammal traps, live mammal traps. Um, what you can do is you can put these longworth traps up on an elevated platform in the stalk level of, of suitable habitat and sometimes you'll get them there. But they're so tiny, the longworth traps rely on a little trip mechanism that sometimes they don't activate the trip mechanism because they're so tiny and light. So they can be difficult to find, but we can do at release stations, maybe um, putting out camera traps or feeding stations for those soft releases and just see how they're getting on or are they um, kind of moving through the, the habitat. Um, camera traps are great for that. But again, going out and doing the nest surveys year on year, each autumn and early winter is the way we will find out whether we're having build, numbers building up um, over time. And that relies on people power. There's just an example of a tweak from NEP where they found um, 48 harvest mouse nests in 350 meters of, of reeds. Um, so doing really well down there. Um, there's just um, some example of kind of camera trap um, stations. You don't need the sound on this, but you can put out feeding stations and just see if you have them in certain landscapes, um, like reed beds that are hard to get into and monitor. Um, and this is another one from um, Sussex Wildlife Trust, where they're monitoring a, a kind of feeding station in a reed bed and they found harvest mice, water voles, water shrews, um, and several other species there, but that's a little harvest mouse. Um, on the on the feeding station there. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we can do. Um, the, the habitat management that we do for harvest mice, if they, we are going to sustain them and build them into kind of our, uh, our priority list in Ealing, is going to be beneficial for lots of other species. Water voles, as I said, there's some overlap between the habitats they need and the water vole um, sites, it, there's a bit of overlap um, between the site suggested in phase one for the harvest mouse and for the, for the water vole. Um, reintroduction projects, as I said, you know, could we engage people? Could we inspire further action or better action in terms of protection of our green spaces? Um, it is thinking outside the box a little bit. I'm sure some people are probably going to think, oh, crazy Sean and his ideas bringing back lost species. Um, you know, that's fine. I'm happy to take the hit on that. Um, but I think actually it's a great way to engage new audiences with like a nature recovery and we need it more than ever um, at the moment. Um, other things that we might do further down the line, I would see the Harvest Mouse project as very much a first step in terms of if we're going to brand it rewilding Ealing. Um, but water voles are something that actually I've been um, talking about to um, stakeholders and to interested people in Ealing for quite some time. Um, and unfortunately, I think we have probably lost the water vole. There was five um, areas in Ealing where there was promising signs of water voles, but no sightings. When the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust were commissioned to do a survey uh, back in 2009. So we're already 11 years out from that. Um, and those five areas, I've visited all of them, and unfortunately, we've, most of the, most of them have very degraded habitats for water voles because they just haven't been managed for what water voles like. 
and water voles like dense vegetation at the water side and um, they do rely on water for protection and um, they're quite diverse in their appetite they'll feed on lots of different species of waterside vegetation but they need that dense vegetation and they need light getting in and unfortunately in a lot of the habitats that showed promising signs 11 years ago um, there's not enough light getting in because trees have grown and there hasn't been management for um, kind of coppicing um, waterside tree trees and scrub and vegetation so i think a lot of the habitats we had are degraded um, because water wells just haven't been a priority in terms of their management plans but car road in the middle number three here and number two paradise fields were two of those sites that did have signs of water wells in 2009 so um, I think, you know, bringing back water voles is something that we'd love to move on to after the harvest mouse um, question. And then a few of you probably have seen me semi-jokingly referring to beavers on the Brent and bringing back beavers into Ealing, um, which I've been doing as kind of a, a little bit of mischief making and a little bit of like getting people talking. And Anita's not shaking her head there. She knows me very long and very well. Um, but I'm, I'm semi-serious when I say actually, um, beavers on the Brent could be something that actually is feasible and is a good idea because if we go back to water voles, what we would need to do in terms of bringing back water voles to Ealing is high time, high cost, high effort um, in terms of restoring those habitats, first of all, and then maintaining the habitats as suitable for water voles, as well as the costs involved in, in um, trying to connect the habitats. So one of the things they'll need in these corridors along the canals, the canal side is concrete, um, and they just will not survive on concrete banks and canals. So we would need to try and restore with core matting and native vegetation on the sides of the canals to try and interlink some of those connected habitats. And that's gonna be at, you know, potentially tens of thousands of pounds cost. One of the other things that we can do is, you know, if we brought back beavers to the Brent River Park, beavers create the exact type of habitat that water voles need, free of charge and without volunteer work and without the, the constant management needed to be cutting down and coppicing trees on the, on the riverside and letting the light in that then benefits all of the other biodiversity that exists in, in the kind of habitats they create. So I jokingly, somewhat jokingly, have been referring to beavers as a good idea, but I do think actually that it's not a fa as fantastical an idea as, um, as some might think. Um, I'm not as crazy as some might think. Um, we've already seen the first urban beaver reintroduction project in Plymouth um, quite recently, and uh, beavers are back in Britain. They're um, being reintroduced all over Britain, and the benefits that they're finding um, with bringing back beavers to our, our river systems in terms of flood mitigation and preventing the kind of um, fast kind of uh, flash flooding downstream. Um, they're holding back water with their dams and with their kind of kind of new wetland creation um, and they're slowing down the flow of rivers and actually where they live in deep rivers they don't even make dams so one of the things that people are very wary of them is that they're going to build dams and flood everywhere and um, that's not quite how it works so if you want to learn more about beaver reintroductions there's a brilliant documentary that came out recently called beavers without borders um, have a look at that um, maybe not tonight if you're all rewilded out after this. So um, just a quick reminder on our ethos at Ealing Wildlife Group, we're about the three C's, we're about conservation, community and collaboration. So um, we can't do any of our work alone. We do it collaborating with other uh, groups in Ealing as well. Um, Selborne Society, Friends of Horsenden Hill are the two that are in this area we're proposing for the phase one of Harvest Mouse um, reintroduction. Um, but really community uh, involvement and volunteering is something that we will really rely on. Loads of links there. Um, I'll post them on the group as well if you want to do further reading. Um, we need to get the Ealing Wildlife Group Mouseketeers uh, up and running. Or if you have better branding ideas than that, uh, do let me know. And if you want to get in touch and learn more or talk about, you know, where you might volunteer to cover in terms of nest finding missions, just drop us a line on hello at ealingwildlifegroup.com. Um, and I think that's it. I'm going to stop sharing and go back to um, full meeting mode and then uh, have a look at the chat function for a second and see if there's any um, questions I haven't answered. But uh, let's see. Lawrence asked, is joining as a volunteer available now? It said it was closed due to COVID before Q resident desperate to get involved. Lawrence, um, our volunteer list is never closed. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, basically, when we've cancelled certain events due to COVID, it's just been because it was difficult to organise or um, we couldn't socially distance on certain events. But it's not like volunteering is closed. We're actually doing a volunteer task day tomorrow at Horsenden Farm. Um, 
clearing out uh, a pond and um, kind of making it better for great crested newts as well as putting in a new bird hide um, near our feeding station. So there are volunteer events. The best way to keep in touch with what we're doing is to sign up to our newsletter online and then you'll be kept up to date with everything that we're doing and also join our Facebook group, not the page, the group itself and look at the events tab on there. They'll all be posted there as well. But we're absolutely keen to get all volunteers, as many volunteers involved as possible and our Costins Lane New Nature Reserve um, there's some groundworks going on there next week to put in our storage container foundation and um, potentially pond if, if it's not too wet. Um, but once we get some of the bigger works done on the Costins Lane Nature Reserve, then next spring we'll need loads of volunteers and probably on a very regular basis, maybe twice a month or definitely once a month um, at the weekends, we'll be doing big volunteer task days there. So join our news, sign up to our newsletter is the best advice. We don't have a specific volunteer program or volunteer list well in advance we just month on month announce what's happening um vanda said just poking around with a stick upset the mice so they leave the nests um gentle poking is involved is advised so really just parting the vegetation with a stick will just allow you to see the different layers in the vegetation and identify a nest but don't want you going thrashing through vegetation with a stick it's just literally to part um dense vegetation and see if there's any nest there they should be fine if they if you do disturb them you know, they'll leave the nest and as long as you, you know, don't disturb it too much, they'll come back to it once you're gone. Um, so gentle, uh, gentle with that. Um, let's see. Sorry, I didn't get the, the um, messages as I was going on the screen. Would wormwood scrubs be suitable? Uh, to my shame, I've never been to wormwood scrubs. I, I know I should. And I know it's under, uh, under threat at the moment with HS2. Um, it's an area on my list that I want to check out, but I've never got around to it, unfortunately. Brent the Meadow, uh, Lily has asked, would that be suitable? Very good habitat, but is it sustainable? Is it connected? It's kind of isolated by allotments and the A40. So I would say it's kind of um, suitable habitat, but um, a little bit of an island and maybe not the best place to focus on um, if we want a sustainable population of harvest mice. Um, cool. So I'm going to open it to the floor. If anyone wants to ask a question, um, you can unmute and um, ask a question and we'll go um, around the room or um, maybe if we if we don't, we might get Elliot just to talk a little bit about what he has planned for harvest mice. But are there any questions in particular first or any comments? Did it answer everything? Uh, hi, Sean. I, I wrote down a couple of things in the chat, but just you can answer them. Yeah. Um, do, do other rodents have uh, above ground nests or is it only uh, the harvest mice that we would see? Um, that's a good question. I'm pretty sure most of them, uh, it's pretty unique that they would have above ground nests and certainly high off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, you'll occasionally get wood mice um, nesting in you know, bird boxes or cavities in trees or, or a kind of a cavity that they find somewhere. But none of the other rodents actually build a nest like, up off the ground um, in kind of in grass. So that's pretty distinctive. Yeah. And someone and else asked was about the yeah. density, what density you might get. And I saw in one of your videos, I think they had like 50 nests in 350 meters or something. Yeah, 48 nests in a 350 meter stretch. So if you get a good, if you get good habitat um, and, you know, the population has been building up over quite some time, you can get, they called it a, a harvest mouse. Um, I can't remember what they called it, but it was basically a very, very dense uh, population of them and lots and lots of nests, breeding nests and kind of um, individual nests as well. I was just thinking if we're looking for them, that's like one every seven metres, you know, in a linear bit. So I'm, that's not exactly zillions, you know. No, it's not. It, you do have to get your eye in. Um, and what we might do maybe, depending on how the first round of uh, volunteer, loan volunteer power goes, we might organise maybe, I was at Paradise Fields the other day, maybe a group task day where we all take a two metre strip and we mm -hmm. all go across the same field so that we have know we've covered the entire area systematically and, and, and we can say we don't think there's harvest mice nests there. Yeah, sounds, sounds a good plan. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, we need to be a little bit systematic about it. But I think the first thing is just get people interested and enthused and start spreading mm. the word to look out for it. Because, you know, we've, we've found out lots of wildlife um, biodiversity in Ealing um, through people just posting a picture or saying they've spotted something on Ealing Wildlife Group Facebook. So um, I think people power is, is the thing that will help us with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Any questions before we talk to Elliot? Emma, do you see the uh, forest school being maybe uh, interested in this? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Forest school, I'm thinking about the schools that I work in outside of it doing outdoor learning. Like I can just imagine giving a year group a task of like a breeding project. I mean, that would be spectacular to run with schools. Yeah, just I think so. Utterly amazing. So yeah, I'm very, very much, I'm all in, Sean, all in. Good, good. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be uh, knocking on your door for help. <laughs> Linda, were you going to ask something? Yeah, I was just going to ask about a, a bridge across the canal as a sort of wildlife corridor. How feasible do you think that would be to, and to, to you know, to encourage species to get from one side to the other? Um, it's feasible, but um, who's going to fund it? I guess is the question. Um, mm. You know, there are a couple of bridges and a couple of um, points where um, we think wildlife is crossing the canal anyway. But a tiny little vulnerable mouse that relies on dense vegetation, it's maybe a different story. So, um, yeah, we need to kind of start getting our thinking caps on of how we could connect both sides of the canal, I think. Sean, do, do you actually need a field where a farmer's been with all the maize and everything else? Can they, do they need some sort of food like from a farmer's field? No, I think that's the, the misconception, Anita, that, you know, they're, they're confined only to arable crops. Yeah. The arable crop thing, I think, is a bit of a red herring. Like I, I warned at the second video there that it's like it's a little bit skewed towards farmers um, yeah. because they're saying, oh, harvest mice rely on cereal crops and the combine Definitely. harvester is the cause of them going. Yeah. Actually, no, cereal crops were only here for a very short time in harvest mouse evolution. What they need is grassland um, and yeah. natural spaces and rough grassland and messy yeah. areas you know, are their natural habitat. It just so happens mm. that they were seen a lot and very and seemed to be abundant at the time of harvest, where, yeah. which is where they got their name. So arable fields and crop fields are not their stronghold. It's the wild natural spaces that they want. Right. And also reed beds and things like and, that. Yeah, reed yeah. beds and, and ditches and yeah, yeah, connectivity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do people, on a, on a kind of show of hands of who's like on screen, people like, Keen to get out there and start searching for nests? Yeah, good, cool. Um, Elliot, maybe we'll just ask you about the kind of um, the practicalities of, of establishing a breeding program because you you have harvest mice yourself, right? Yeah, well, so first of all, I'll say, sure, I thought the presentation was great. Thanks for inviting me along and telling me it was happening. So, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, but yeah, maybe so, before that, Elliot, sorry, just if you want to introduce like who you are and what you do, that would be great as well. Uh, pro probably, yeah, just just quickly, I won't take too much time. But uh, so I, I set up an organisation called Citizen Zoo, uh, which is all about very much community led conservation, doing um, various rewilding stuff very much in the urban context. I'm the biodiversity officer in Kingston, so I do a lot of my stuff in, in the Kingston area, but we, we're currently running a water bowl reintroduction. We've um we would do stuff with like grasshoppers a lot of, uh, we're looking to very similar things that she was talking about even like the beaver trials and stuff like that and just trying to really see how we can try and view the sort of urban landscape in a slightly more wild wild way and um, but harvest mice is something that i've been interested in a very very long time actually the uh sort of rewilding champion Derek gal gave me a bunch of harvest mice a good few years ago and I've kept on to them ever since with the ambition to hopefully get them into schools to try and do some level of community-led school conservation program where the, the children can be actively involved with supplying um, yeah, water, uh, the, the harvest mice into, into the, the breeding program, um, which, I, which I think is, should be quite an exciting initiative. It has pretty much not um, had that much momentum. I've, I've had harvest mice for about four years and yet to really kick it off the ground. So they're just sort of sitting there ready to go. Um, but um, yeah, it's great to see the well thought through proposal and hopefully was, if, 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 well, if you move on that sort of timeline, I would love to maybe sort of emulate that here as well. And uh, that might also potentially result in some cost savings. I don't know, in terms of like a, if, we're, if we're purchasing stuff in bulk and uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah just and then learning from each other um, because it's very much a similar proposal in terms of the community being at the very heart of the conservation work. But I suppose one quick thing to say is that, yeah, I've had harvest mice in my garden for about four years now. So I'm quite, it, it, we have them in all different tanks and stuff. So I've learned quite a lot about how to uh, look after them and stuff. And hopefully we might be able to provide some of that knowledge um, moving forward. And, and, and some mice, right? 
<laughs> and some mice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the problem is because I got them from Derek Gow, they were all quite they were quite inbred to start, and they've only got more inbred in the last few years. So, yeah, really good to get increase that genetic pool. But it, um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're beautiful things to look after. They're so charismatic. They're a joy just to watch because they're just so they're just full of energy and feel full of life. And um, yeah, they're, they're amazing creatures. Cool. Thanks, Elliot. Um, any comments on uh, beavers on the Brent? <laughs> Well, it's, 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 people laugh, but it's genuine. So uh, we're actually having conversations, which I'll we'll talk to you more about, Sean. But we're hoping to next, early next year set up a London wide beaver working group with the Beaver Trust, um, right. and that, that that should be going ahead in January. Just to uh, visit places across London where there might be potential sites. I think the real interest with beavers is we're seeing lots of beavers in the Tay, um, you know, being cold still, but we're looking to come actually use some of those beavers, like the one in Plymouth bring it down to sort of maybe trial areas um as good community engagement elements and all sorts so there's genuinely a real momentum behind it um made more so however you much think what stanley johnson's got on the bandwagon and wants to push it forward so yeah um, so that's that's that's, that's given some political good. Impetus. it's good to know i've got some uh some other crazy beaver fanatics on site <laughs> <laughs> cool um any more questions before we before we close it Hi, it's um, James, James here. Hi. Just wondered um, if any work has already been done on analysing the owl um, pellets from the boxes, and that may help identify if we've got populations of um, the harvest mice. In a word, no. Um, to, but the reason being, um, lockdown has hindered us a little bit in terms of getting out to all of the boxes and certainly collecting pellets. Um, the issue with barn owls in tree boxes is they're tending to regurgitate the pellets in the box. Um, so we're gonna have to go and um, do a clean out. Myself and Caroline, um, vice chair of Beating Wildlife Group, went out a few weekends ago and did some work um, clearing out some of the boxes and retrieving some of the memory cards from camera traps on boxes. But we've still got a good, a good number of other boxes to go and clear out. So if we find pellets in any of them, yeah, we will be keeping them. And certainly the one that we know the barn owls were in, we're very interested in retrieving those pellets. So um, not yet, but hopefully um, we'll be doing some pellet dissection and uh, working out what they're feeding on. Great. Yeah. yeah. Good I'm just checking the chat to see if there's anything else. Uh, where do you see resistance from residents, etc.? Chantal asked. Um, I don't see that there could be much resistance to reintroducing harvest mice. Um, I think some people who are, you know, um, seasoned naturalists and conservationists might be just a bit worried that are we doing it correctly? Um, what impact would captive bred harvest mice have on native ecosystems and things like that? Um, potentially, you know, um, is the habitat, how do we know the habitats that we're proposing are suitable, sustainable and connected? And um, I think we just have to do our homework and be as best prepared as possible and put together a good proposal and try it and see. As I said at the start, the question for me is, um, why wouldn't we try to do this? And why wouldn't we try to bring back a species that has been wiped out by us and now looks to have suitable habitat across the borough with changing land use? Um, I think it'd be a good idea to try and see if we can create a, re a reservoir of this species in Ealing and, and have it as something to be proud of. I think where we'll get resistance down the line is if we go water voles next and start putting in bids for funding to change the landscape of the canals and stuff. You might have some boaters saying we don't want this kind of, you know, um, canal side vegetation and coir rolls and, and stuff. Um, for mooring reasons, or you might have um, kind of other objections to it in terms of um, land use and protecting water voles are, um, you know, protecting the areas that they're in. And uh, that could cause some people to have um, a bit of a reservation. I think that the big resistance will come if and when, if we propose beavers on the brand, I think we'd have a bit more convincing to do because people are scared of beavers because they think they're going to flood everywhere. Um, and we have to actually convince from the evidence that actually, you know, there may be localized flooding that can cause some um, irritation or inconvenience to people. Or we might have to say, you know what, we've lost that area of the Brent River Park because it's underwater now. But actually the benefits that they provide um, should outweigh the costs. And if there are areas where beavers are causing trouble, you mitigate for that by putting in um, 
interventions. You know, you protect certain trees if you want to keep them and prevent the beavers um, taking them down. Um, and you mitigate with a really clever device called a beaver deceiver, which uh, prevents them building dams or flooding areas too much um, if they have a dam. So there's ways around it. But I would say on the beaver front, we're, you know, we're all talk really about bringing biodiversity back on the Brent. I was on an event a few weeks ago um, speaking on it and they were talking about all of the things we can and should be doing and all of these projects we're doing to increase biodiversity on the Brent. And to me, it seems like we're struggling and throwing money and time and effort at all these interventions and river management when actually this, the solution to a lot of the problems is staring us in the face that beavers would do all of that for us for free and all we have to do is educate that there can be some management issues but we manage them as and when they come up that's the way i see it yeah. and we need can to I, can, I just, can i just add a quick other point something that i yeah. suggest you might potentially want to look into so with, with the water well project that i'm trying to currently run in kingston one thing we're probably about two years off our actual release or a year off our actual release but one thing we're going to spend a lot of the next year doing is you, we've got about 100 volunteers on the waterfall project a lot of them are dog walkers and we really want to try and set up a dog walking sort of friendly uh group to try and encourage nature friendly dog walking especially in our nature reserves and stuff i don't know what the impact of dog walking is going to be to harvest mice but i imagine it will be um well, not as not as difficult with cats, but still, there's still some disturbance that might might make it difficult. So, um, uh, engaging with dog walkers, uh, especially if that's quite a, quite a, um, the sites you're looking to release in, is it, quite a, a prudent thing to do and, and start early with. Um, so, I just let the dog walking community. And then, yeah. uh, that's the At the start, you said there were six bars in, in London with um, harvest mice. Do you know which ones they are? Um, I have it somewhere. I don't know offhand. It was six burrs um, have records of them since 1996. So some of them are a long time ago and they were all on the outskirts of London. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I have it somewhere. I can send it over to you if I find it. I think it might be in the further reading actually. Um, some people are heading off. It's fine to head off. It's fine to stay as well. There's just a couple of comments come in that have made me uh, <laughs> smile. Um, Someone said, Claire said, such a shame the Marnham Fields Canal Bridge is closed. It's only closed to people. Um, harvest mice or other wildlife can still get across. Uh, they're a lot smaller than us, which is good. Um, and then Chantal, very canny of her, uh, has said, um, go in with the smallest road and put the goal of reintroducing the largest. You got it, Chantal. Uh, there's the strategy right there. Um, Everyone else, Paula is saying, was thinking of a dog for company for work whilst working from home, but maybe could have mice instead. Please discuss. Uh, I absolutely agree. I think mice in your living room, Paula, would be a great idea. Um, or your back garden. They're, they're fairly hardy little things, um, as long as they have some shelter. Um, Linda, can't do much on the ground, but happy to help with social media awareness. That's brilliant, Linda. Thank you. Um, a short film of a local Mouseketeer event would be nice. That's great. Actually, we've seen that with the OWL project. Um, we had one of our members uh, volunteer to do a little bit of a documentary for us on it. And it definitely video content for social media about projects like this is something that we do put a bit of focus on because it does illustrate what we're doing and capture people's imagination. And, and um, it's a good way of getting people involved. Yeah. Cool. So I think that's it, guys, unless there's anything else that you'd like to um, ask or comment on. I'm sure. Is it possible to get a copy of the presentation? Sure. And um, what I'm doing, going to do is I'm going to put a recording of it on our YouTube channel okay, and great. on yeah. um, Facebook group as well. Perfect. Because I've got, I'm in another sort of rewilding group and um, I didn't have time to share this, but that will be really good if they could see it. No worries. Yeah. Um, are you all happy that this part of it is on uh, YouTube at a later date? Yeah. If anyone isn't, just drop me a line on hello at ealingwildlifegroup.com and I'll blur your face out or something. <laughs> cool. Chantal said, fab way to spend a Friday evening. Couldn't agree more. Um, but uh, it's been a long week and I think it's definitely wine o'clock now for me. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everyone. And um, keep in touch and let us know if you're going to go out on a nest mission. Thank you, Una yeah, and so. Una's Bye. partner for clapping. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye, Sean. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.